Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we take you inside the plant churning out artillery rounds as the U.S. sends more shells to Ukraine. Plus, watch a Coast Guard rescue that will send shivers down your spine. And also, we sit with the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee. See what's next in your benefits. And later, we learn about the massive seaplane DARPA is asking for. It's those stories and more in the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. The United States has been sending artillery rounds to Ukraine as the nearly year-long war rages on there. But to make sure the U.S. retains enough shells for its own troops, the Pentagon is asking for increased artillery round production. To see how that gets done, the Military Times visited an ammunition plant in Scranton, Pennsylvania and takes you inside for this report. The front line in Ukraine. Each day, the country's defenders fire thousands of artillery rounds at Russian forces, holding them back with frequent barrages. The source for much of that ammunition? U.S. Army artillery reserves, more than a million rounds and counting by early 2023. Since the middle of last year, the U.S. has sent tens of thousands of rounds per month to the effort in Ukraine, a significant use of an American stockpile meant to train and equip U.S. soldiers around the world. To backfill that stockpile and keep up with the rapid use of howitzer shells, U.S. officials said recently they want to dramatically expand artillery round production, specifically the 155mm rounds the Pentagon has been sending en masse to Ukraine. On the conventional ammunition side, so I'm just talking about kind of the artillery production side. I believe it's um, the production ramp we're undergoing in terms of how fast we're trying to do it is probably the fastest since Korea. What will take us the longest to ramp up is the metal parts production. So we started there. Those will be initial ramp up contracts have been focused on. Um, and there's a lot to that. It is uh, actually pretty complicated manufacturing. To give a sense of numbers, prior to the war in Ukraine, the U.S. could manufacture around 14,400 artillery rounds per month. But with the demand skyrocketing, officials want to increase that number to around 90,000 per month by fiscal year 2025. To get it done, they'll need to turn to facilities like the Scranton Army Ammunition Plant, where Defense News Weekly recently got a chance to see how shells are made. There, plant manager Rich Hansen gave some details about the facility and how the rounds are produced. They're, they're 20 foot lengths of steel. Um, they weigh about 2,000 pounds. We cut those um, into billets uh, so that they'll go into the the furnace to get heated. This furnace will heat that billet or those billets to 2,000 degrees um, while it uh, encircles the inside of the furnace. Then it deposits it on it, it deposits it on the other side uh, via material handling equipment, and will go to our forge press. Once the, uh, once the forging process is complete, the last press stroke pushes the billet down into the subway system where it'll go down onto a conveyor for cooling. Along a lengthy run of conveyor, 
conveyors, while it cools, the shell is given a series of inspections to make sure it meets precise specifications to safely and accurately shoot out of the barrel of an Army howitzer and land on a target. All right, so what's going to happen here, this is Bliss 3's hot inspection area. The operator's going to stop the part, pull it off the line with the, uh, with the assisted lifting device, and he's going to run through his check. So he's going to run through a series of internal dimension checks, external dimension checks. He's going to check for concentricity, make sure that the part is, uh, is meeting the technical data package high. So once it leaves here, it cools for a few hours, and then it comes out, goes through a shop blast system, comes out the other end of shop blast, and then it's re-inspected cold. Delivered to a series of machines that polish and add copper bands to the shells, they then head to nosing, where the distinctive tips are shaped onto a rapidly reheated round. After more checks, they're delivered via robotic trolley to heat treatment, where the metal is once again made glowing hot before being dumped into a 6,000 gallon oil bath that cools it down. The process, Hansen said, gives the shell the right chemical properties to lethally shatter on impact, causing as much damage as possible to a target. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to put, we're trying to instill chemical properties into the steel so that it does what it's designed to do. This round is designed to kill people. So we want to make sure that when it hits the ground and explodes, that it breaks up into little tiny parts and those parts kill people. That's what we do. We build things to kill people. From there, they're polished and washed again, and the nose and copper bands are given final threading for fuses to be added and to fit the rifling of the big gun's barrels. Finally, they're coated with phosphate, then painted green and set aside for transport. The shells aren't actually finished in Scranton. From there, they go to Iowa, where they're loaded with explosives at another specialized facility. Creating an artillery round is a complicated process that officials said isn't easy to expand given the specialized equipment required to turn raw metal into precisely crafted artillery rounds. But the Army says that's the goal. I spoke to the Commanding General of the Joint Program Executive Office for Armaments and Ammunition, Brigadier General John Rhyme, located at Picatinny Arsenal, about the plans to accommodate the ramped up production. We really got you know three lines of effort here. You know, our first line of effort is you know, how do we quickly uh, leverage our existing facilities, right? These are our government-owned, contractor-operated facilities. Uh, I think there's five that, that are critical, you know, in terms of what we're doing today. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, our second line of effort is is um, focus on industry and how do we uh, quickly add additional capacity with our industry partners. And then thirdly, um, you know, we've got a whole effort aligned towards international capacity. The biggest challenge is increasing the capacity and speed to produce the metal shells. Today, the limiting factor in 155 production is metal parts. And so we refer to that, you know, as, hey, we're operating the speed of steel. So our efforts have been focused at quickly expanding our ability to produce metal parts. You may have seen that we recently awarded a contract to IMT up in Canada, and they're going to be um, producing metal parts on our behalf. The service is working to build up that capability and modernize its facilities, and is adding a fully automated production line in Garland, Texas, to produce shells. A new facility in Iowa is planned, and the Army is preparing to award contracts to add two more facilities capable of loading, assembling, and packing the shells. Some of the work was already scheduled as part of a massive modernization overhaul of the organic industrial base, but now that work is being accelerated. At the same time, the Army is modernizing the actual rounds it builds to increase range and that contains safer explosive fill. On the international side, the Army recently selected Northrop Grumman and Global Military Products to compete for orders on a contract worth over a half a billion dollars 
to assist other countries in increasing industrial capacity to produce 155mm ammunition. Rhyme also talked about what he sees as some of the biggest impediments to the process. There are some supply chain concerns, particularly in the realm of propellant charges, but overall, the Army is taking steps to mitigate any potential issues. You know, that, that, that's some of the, the challenge that, um, you know, we see that this is, you know, kind of a niche capability. Okay. There's not a large, there is no, mm -hmm. you know, commercial equivalent. You know, a lot of this stuff, this is for, you know, military use only. And so, um, you know, um, I mean, it's unprecedented in terms of what we've seen and, and kind of ramp up the production. I mean, this goes back to, you know, Korean War era. Um, you know, where we're at today at, you know, at the scale we're operating at. With the war in Ukraine continuing with no end in sight, U.S. arms production will likely remain under increased pressure on a number of fronts. Bradley fighting vehicles and Abrams tanks are also being exported to the fight, with the Biden administration and members of Congress pledging continued military support for the months to come. How that aid plays out and the impacts on the defense industry are topics we'll be tracking at Defense News. See our coverage at defensenews.com. From Washington, D.C., I'm Jen Judson. And in news from around the military, the Coast Guard recently undertook a harrowing rescue of a boater off the coast of Oregon. On February 3rd, Coast Guardsmen from Cape Disappointment responded to a stricken vessel in rough seas, requiring a rescue swimmer to attempt a daring move to try to get the boater. The man was pulled to safety from the water following the capsizing, but the story went on from there. Turns out the man was suspected of stealing the boat days before. For more on the story, head to militarytimes.com. Also, this week marked President Joe Biden's second State of the Union address. In the annual speech, Biden addressed several national security topics and called for more support for the country's veteran population. The third piece of that agenda is support our veterans. <laughs> veterans are the backbone and the spine of this country. They're the best of us. I've always believed that we have a sacred obligation to equip those we send to war and care for those and their family when they come home. My administration is providing assistance in job training, housing, and now helping lower-income veterans get VA care debt-free. And our troops in Iraq have faced and Afghanistan have faced many dangers, one being stationed at bases breathing in toxic smoke from burn pits. The VA is pioneering new ways of linking toxic exposure to disease, already helping more veterans get benefits. And tonight, I'm announcing we're expanding eligibility to veterans suffering from nine respiratory cancers. I'm also calling on Congress to pass a law to make sure veterans devastated by toxic exposure in Iraq and Afghanistan finally get the benefits and the comprehensive health care they deserve. Coming up, we sit down with the chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, so stick around. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. Representative Mike Bost took the helm of the House Veterans Affairs Committee in January and has big plans. Military Times Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane spoke to Bost in a wide-ranging interview Chairman, thanks for sitting down with us. Thanks Just wanted to talk to you about what the priorities are going to be for the upcoming session sure. for the House Veterans Affairs Committee. You're taking over as chairman this year. What do you see as the, the most important topics and what are you going to be broaching first? Well, a, a lot of it is oversight. Hmm. Remember last year, we passed the PACT Act. Now, that's the largest expansion of medical uh, and uh, helping our veterans at that level hmm. and the largest expansion of veterans that we will be seeing. We need to make sure that it is implemented exactly the way we passed it. It is a lot of money, but it is vitally important to do it right. I know for right now, we've already talked to the VA, they're in the process right now of, of those who are in a situation where they could even be on hospice or they're in a really bad situation. They're gonna go first. 
but then everybody else starts through the system. But one of the most important things we did with the PACT Act, if you remember when the PACT Act came up, I didn't vote for the first part yeah. because it was not soup yet. And it was not, VA even said, we can't implement it because you didn't put the right things in there and you didn't put the right funding in there. We gotta make sure that when we move forward, and now that they said that we have got the right in there, that we do move forward in a way that no people that are receiving benefits from VA now lose their, out on their benefits. So we've got to make sure we provide the health care that we're providing right now for those and then bring in the news and without losing anybody. I know, I know VA has already said that they expect their backlog to go up and that's been one of the big concerns. Is this gonna snarl the whole system? What's, do you have an idea of what the, the timeline or the triggers for that are gonna be? When are you gonna to start to panic that maybe this is right. out of control? Well, it, it's, it needs to start up right away. Okay. And so we're keeping abreast of it right now. My hope is um, we're getting their timeline from them. We will monitor it very, very closely. We have a great oversight staff that will monitor that you add with that, we're still trying to deal with the electronic health records and the problems there and the dangers that are existing for our veterans. And only five, we're, we're, we've only got it in five facilities and they're not big facilities. But the wheels came off right off the start. And you know that, that then throws more of a workload on us by trying to make that right, trying to make the PAC Act right. And we're still concerned about uh, the Mission Act. Mm -hmm. Remember, our veterans are not supposed to be on weight. They're not, they don't need to wait for receiving their, their health care. They need to be able to get in. If they can't get in, then they can move to the private sector. We believe that there's places where there's still, no, we know there's places where that's still falling through. All right, great. Chairman, thank you so much. Thank Looking you. Looking forward to covering all this with you this year. So. Look forward to it. All right. Thanks, Leo. Tune in next week to see part two of our conversation with Chairman Bost. And now for Defense Dollars. Turkey will build its first indigenous tank with a South Korean transmission. Manufacturer SNT Dynamics announced its deal with BMC, the Turkish Qatari partnership that builds the Altai. The South Korean company said the deal includes $74.9 million of supply until 2027. The contract has an option to supply Turkey for two years after that for $141 million. The companies signed the long-awaited deal after field tests and assessments in 2022. The Altai's manufacturer, BMC, expects to deliver the first two tanks to the Turkish government in May of this year. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency wants cargo planes that can take off and land in the water. DARPA has asked two companies to design an experimental seaplane that can transport cargo to and from the water. General Atomics and Aurora Flight Sciences will build the competing designs for the Liberty Lifter seaplane. DARPA wants it to be a long-range and low-cost aircraft similar in size to the C-17 Globemaster, which can carry an Abrams tank. DARPA wants the aircraft to be able to handle waves up to about 8 feet high. Up next, our personal finance expert talks you through how to financially prepare for retirement. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack talks about which loans you should prioritize paying off before retirement. According to the U.S. Census, all baby boomers will be 65 or older by 2030. So for millions of Americans, retirement is on the horizon. What's even more alarming is that more than half of all Americans are unprepared for retirement. Starting early, planning, and saving are the tried and true ways to build wealth and be ready for the golden years. Being financially secure before and throughout retirement hinges upon being as debt-free as possible. So when making your plans, focus on paying off student loans, auto loans, personal loans, and credit cards. Carrying the financial burden of student loans into retirement wreaks havoc on your income. Strive to pay off student loans. 
Private student loans, refinancing, or consolidating can help. Also, focus on owning your car outright before retiring to avoid paying thousands in interest on car loans. The same goes for any debt that accrues interest over time. Try to eliminate personal loans and credit debt, anything that'll eat away at your savings. In retirement planning, time is both your friend and your foe, so whether you're actively planning or just starting out, concentrate on keeping debt low and savings high at all times. That way, you'll reach retirement with your wealth and peace of mind. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, navigate over to Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And to brush up on recent events and win trivia night at your local base, sign up for our early bird brief for stories delivered to your inbox each weekday. It's also in audio. Check out the podcast version out now. And if social media is where you get your headlines, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. When we come back, we see what's inside an F-18 pilot's kit. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. Naval aviators have to spend hours in their aircraft but it takes more than a flight suit to dress for the job. They also have to have survival gear on their person. Lieutenant David Catano shows us what's in his kit. I'm Lieutenant David Catano. I fly F-18s for the US Navy, and this is what's in my kit. This is my G-suit. It will squeeze my legs and keep the blood in my head to allow me to pull more G's and uh, execute fashion maneuvers. This is my flight vest. Holds uh, much of our flight equipment and survival equipment. We have our uh, life jacket, survival radio, communications hose, and other survival equipment. The computer inside the helmet projects flight information onto the visor allowing us to look anywhere and still have the information in our eyes. The mask allows us to get oxygen while we're flying, flying at higher altitudes. It also has a mic inside, allowing us to talk to our wingmen, our flight leads, and uh, other people as well. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us at militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.